welcome to In Focus with Ajaz Heather. We begin tonight with a discussion of strategic developments in Afghanistan. Yesterday, Pakistan Army Chief General Kamar Javed Bajwa visited Kabul and met with Afghan President Ashraf Ghani. He was also accompanied by Prime Minister's Special Envoy for Afghanistan, Ambassador Mohammad Sadiq. The meeting came as expectations rise about an intra-Afghan dialogue later this month. Earlier on 7th June, the U.S. Special Envoy for Afghanistan Reconciliation, Zalmeh Khalilzad, met General Bajwa and Rahul Pindi. According to a U.S. Embassy readout, the two took note of recent progress created by the Eid ceasefire and accelerated prisoner releases, as well as reduced violence ahead of intra-Afghan negotiations. Later the same day, Khalilzad and commander of NATO's Resolute Support Mission in Afghanistan, General Scott Miller, met with the Taliban delegation in Doha. The group's spokesperson, Sohail Shaheen, said their leader, Mullah Baradar Akhun, discussed the prisoners' release in intra-Afghan talks. As we discussed last night, General Bajwa's Kabul dash suggests that the pace is picking up on taking the February deal forward. That assessment was right, with more details coming in about the meeting. General Bajwa also met with Dr. Abdullah Abdullah, Kabul's focal person for taking the intra-Afghan talks forward. Yesterday's discussions focused on the issue of prisoner release, Assurances to Dr. Abdullah for assistance in the talks, border management, and ultimate repatriation of Afghan refugees. Meanwhile, the spoiler element continues to muddy the waters, which was clear from tweets put out by two former NDS directors, Amrullah Saleh and Ramatullah Nabil. To discuss the situation further, we have with us Hashim Vadatyar. Mr. Vadatyar has experience in areas of peace, security, and developments in Afghanistan. We also have with us Rahimullah Yusuf Zai, the resident editor of the news, and joins us from Peshawar. Let me uh, begin with Mr. Vadatyar. Mr. Vadatyar, there was a lot of um, criticism, even within the U.S., about how President Trump was going about the deal, but I think that is now in the past. Um, it seems that uh, the pieces are kind of falling together and uh, all the stakeholders now realize that this is the only framework in and through which they can move forward. Would you agree with that assessment? First of all, um, 100 days discussion is better than a one day fight. And now it has been realized here in Washington and broader in the United States as well that the only way um, having stability in Afghanistan is through a road, and that road is peace talks. Um, so that has been widely realized here in the United States. But the other thing is that the United States is also thinking like about the other actors within Afghanistan and in the region to bring them together for um, a cohesion about the peace talks in Afghanistan. One of them is uh, Pakistan. It is also realized here in the United States that Islamabad wanted to be a bridge between Kabul and the Taliban. Like Iran is trying to uh, get in and also to be part of that, having meetings with the foreign ministers of Qatar and a number of others. Uh, so, so there are a number of players in this part, but however, the United States stand is that to accelerate talks with the Taliban uh, and bring its troops back to the United States. Okay. Let me go to Mr. Yusuf Zai on this. Mr. Yusuf Zai, Maltyar has put across these three salient points. I want to know uh, how much do you agree with what he's saying? Of course, uh, in terms of what he's talking about, the various actors internally in Afghanistan and also externally, the regional powers, they're all stakeholders. But give me a sense, your sense of what you think of Mr. Valtiar's three salient points. Yes, I think uh, he is right that there are a number of stakeholders and they have to be involved and uh, their cooperation has to be sought. Uh, but I still believe that the three most important stakeholders are Taliban, the US, and the Afghan government. Others can help. Others can, uh, you know, break the deadlock. But uh, the decisions would, would have to be made by the Afghan government and Taliban and hopefully they will engage 
in the intra-Afghan negotiations. In the near future, I expect the talks to take place in, Jan uh, in July. Uh, let's see how it goes. So I believe that, you know, yesterday's development, like General Bajwa visiting Kabul on an urgent visit, along with the ISI chief and the new Pakistani special envoy to Afghanistan, that is very significant. The Afghan government has always been demanding, whether it was President Karzai or now Ashraf Ghani, that they want to engage with the Pakistani military because they believe they have more powers concerning resolving the Afghan issue. So the politicians from Pakistan also are involved, but the talks are mostly held with the Pakistani military establishment. So that demand has been conceded by Pakistan, not once, but many times. And I think that this could pave the way for developments like completing the exchange of prisoners, which is the biggest hurdle in restarting the Afghan intra-Afghan dialogue. And I think the Lmei Khalizad visit to the region, that was also very significant, even more significant because, you know, the COVID-19 is a big challenge, not only for America and Pakistan and Afghanistan, but the rest of the world. And even then, America has taken interest and he, it is trying to revive or to restart the Afghan peace dialogue. So I think there is a lot of interest, not only in the U.S., but also in Pakistan in Kabul and in the region to revive these peace talks. Uh, in a way, I think that, you know, this can be done. There are only two major disagreements. One was the exchange of prisoners. And I must say, the Afghan government was creating hurdles. It has its own reasons why they are doing it, but they want to use the exchange of prisoners as a bargaining chip. They want to achieve something out of this, especially they want Taliban to reduce violence, as they did for one week on February 22nd to 29, before signing the peace agreement with the U.S. So that is the purpose of the Afghan government. And uh, Secondly, I think, uh, Afghan government was saying that those who are released will not return to the battlefield. But I don't think this can be guaranteed by Taliban or anybody else. So I believe that things are moving in the right direction. The developments of the last two days, Zalmi Khalilzad visits, to Qatar, Pakistan, and Afghanistan now, and General Bajwa's visit to Kabul, this could lead to a breakthrough. And I expect that the prisoners would be eventually released, and that would pay for the intra-Afghan dialogue, which has been delayed, but I think this uh, would have happened because this issue is so complicated and so Absolutely. Old. It's been delayed, but it hasn't, it hasn't been bailed. Um, I'll return to you, Mr. Yusufzai, but let me go back to Mr. Wadat Yar here. Mr. Wadat Yar, one of the issues Mr. Yusufzai has flagged, which is uh, the, the problem with the prisoner release, um, our information is that, uh, as I said yesterday, it was discussed, and I think... Um, it will be resolved. Uh, there's been, obviously, a uh, release in, in trashes, but it will be resolved. But the, there was another issue, and I, I really want to get your view on that, which was the internal political struggle uh, following the presidential election and the impasse uh, that was created between President Ashraf Ghani and Dr. Abdullah Abdullah 
to the point where there were two swearing in ceremonies the same day a few kilometers um, apart from each other but with dr abdullah abdullah now firmly inside the tent and having been assigned the uh, the very important task of being the focal person to take these these talks forward do you think that issue has been resolved and it will have a positive impact on talks i agree there was a big fragmentation in kabul not only between uh, dr abdullah and president kani but other politicians as well Uh, now with this deal afghanistan is having one stand having like a number of politicians together uh, about the peace talks <coughs> so president um, ghani dr abdullah they are not only the two leaders of uh, a political leaders in afghanistan but the others like president karzai a number of others will be part of this high peace council um so there's no more fragmentation um, as we speak now So with this, there is no pretext for the Taliban uh, not to have uh, intra-Afghan dialogue as soon as uh, sp- possible. I do understand that the Taliban are after releasing their prisoners, and that has been expedited. Um, as of last evening, over 3,000 Taliban prisoners released uh, by the Afghan government. Now. Um, the conditions of the afghan government is two things number one reduction in violence and also um, afghan government should be an active part within the intra afghan dialogue that the taliban refrain taliban wants that the government should be represent to 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 take part in the intra afghan dialogue as an afghans not like as a government of afghanistan but i think that now the taliban have have like like green lights like the afghan government can represent um uh, uh, but the name is under discussion whether that will be like a government or uh, part of the intra afghan dialogue but that's also a dispute like if the afghan government can not represent as a government then who the members of the taliban will represent in this intra afghan dialogue dialogue will the taliban agree that they will also attend as afghan representatives not as a as as leading the uh, uh, or representing the taliban groups so th- that's another hurdle that we should need to be dis- addressed and discussed be- before entering into um, intra afghan overall overall i think that there are positive uh, uh, positive steps taken already um for example like in terms of security and fighting in afghanistan if you see there is no um, big attacks in the biggest cities of afghanistan um i and i think also- that and i think that was something the kabul government really wanted because that was the spectacle that kind of you know uh basically uh showed the government to be weak and i think that was an image that the kabul government was not particularly happy with uh well yes but overall there there is a feeling of reduction in violence for example the taliban did not announce the spring offensive yeah um and also if you compare it these months with with the last months with the last year months so the offense was not in the biggest cities of course the war is there in the villages and the rural areas so there are some positive steps steps uh, but this needs to be built like the mutual uh, uh, trust and confidence needs to be built before entering into the um, intra afghan dialogue but there are also concerns like two big concerns concern number one is that uh, some of the military commanders of the taliban they are not fan of like peace talks in afghanistan and they are saying that we we will force the united states to and, and get them out of the country and also they want to by force bring the sharia law and islamic emirate of taliban in uh, uh, in afghanistan so that is uh, a big uh, concern uh, this fragmentation within the taliban which was not felt um in, in the past but now uh, it is being felt that if that continues that would be a problem the second important point is that um look if we will have like uh, a peace agreement and peace pact but in the absence of a strong national security forces to police the future peace pact or peace agreement 
I think the peace agreement will uh, will uh, will break, and the government uh, and the uh, uh, Afghanistan will unfortunately uh, fall to another civil war if there is no national strong uh, security forces or any other external acceptable force. I, I, like I think I think forces. that I think there'll be uh, there'll be guarantees, and I I completely agree with you that both internally as well as external guarantors will have to make sure that uh, Afghanistan doesn't descend into a civil war again. But thank you so much. That was Hashim Vadatyar speaking with us. Uh, before I wrap up, let me go back to Mr. Yusuf Zai. Mr. Yusuf Zai, two points. One raised by uh, Vadatyar about fragmentation. I remember we, we talked about it uh, in an earlier program. And you were of the view, and I think you still are of the view, that there's no major fragmentation uh, with the Taliban. Uh, secondly, give me a sense of, since we're talking about this kind of civil war situation, give me a sense of, uh, you know, the, the significance of some kind of deal where the Taliban have a share of power as a political force. You know, I still believe that there will be no major fragmentation among Taliban. If it has not happened in the last, say, more than 20 years since Taliban emerged in 94-95, and uh, when they were in power and when they were out of power, I haven't seen any major uh, defection. So I think they will remain together by and large. There may be small defections. It has happened. But uh, look at what happened to people who deserted. Correct. You know, they all became nobodies <laughs> as Correct. soon as they quit the Taliban movement. So that's one. I think they have one leader, one Rehbari Shura, and they have by and large abided by whatever was decided. It is going to happen again. The fact they were able to enforce ceasefire twice, you know, sitting in Qatar and Pakistan and, Afghan and Afghanistan and Iran, they could do it again. It won't be a problem. Secondly, I think that, uh, you know, because they believe they have achieved a lot, they're on a winning side. So that will also keep them united. Uh, they will stay together because that is the strength of their success. Uh, thirdly, I believe that, you know, I expect more fragmentation on the Afghan side. You know, with great difficulty, Ghani and Abdullah had reconciled. How long will they reconcile? They already have been in power for five years. And there was always dispute on the appointments, on the policies. And this time, we have to see how long they will stay together. That's a, so that's a very significant point, uh, uh, Mr. Yusuf Zai. Uh, and, and I would tend to agree with you that there is greater likelihood of fragmentation on the Afghan side than uh, within the Taliban ranks. But unfortunately, I've run out of time. Thank you so much for your insights. We shall take a short break and return to discuss Tehran's death sentence to an Iranian citizen for spying for U.S. intelligence services. Stay with us. Welcome back to In Focus. Tehran has sentenced an Iranian citizen to death for spying for U.S. intelligence services. Initial official, official reports suggested that Mahmoud Musavi Majd provided the whereabouts of slain Commander Major General Qasem Soleimani to U.S. intelligence. Iran's judiciary said Musavi Majd also spied for Israel's Mossad. What makes it interesting is the fact that Musavi Majd was in prison when the Soleimani hit happened, the spokesperson for the judiciary, Ghulam Hussain Ismaili, said Majd had given information on Soleimani's movements to the CIA and the Israeli intelligence agency in return for cash. But the judiciary's media office later clarified he had been in jail at the time the general's convoy was attacked in Baghdad. 
The statement said all the legal proceedings in the case of this spy had been carried out long before the martyrdom of Soleimani. Let's discuss this from two angles. How can the spokesperson for the judiciary get it so wrong? And what is the level of transparency in such proceedings? The second question is important also because Iran regularly sentences people on charges of spying for dissident views and even environmental activism. Let's get straight to our panel then. We are joined by Bas Dogantikin, who is chief correspondent for America Desk in the Anadolu Agency and also director of Global American Cultural Exchange. We also have with us Ms. Atafe Togliani, who is a researcher at the University of Tehran uh, in the Faculty of World Studies. Thank you to both panelists. Let me begin by Ms. Togliani. Ms. Togliani, what is the system, uh, you know, the judicial system? Because apparently there is a parallel track. There are revolutionary courts that can sentence people and the proceedings are not very transparent and there is no right to appeal as is normally happens in this kind of sentencing. In fact, uh, this man who is known as um, Mahmoud Musavi Maj, he was uh, recognized as a CIA spy and a Mossad service spy and uh, he was accused of uh, being a traitor and um, um, espionage charges that um, is known as a corruption on earth in Iran and is accused of is um, accused of uh, spying for General uh, Rasim Soleimani's movements inside uh, foreign countries and inside Iran, and he is um, in fact sentenced to death um, in the court. Um, in fact, um, the courts inside Iran, it's, um, um, as you know, the execution, the death execution is uh, um, official, it's, it's just, uh, in fact, um, exists in Iran, um, but it has been um, um, a widespread in different charges, for example, for drug dealing. Uh, but approximately two years ago, these sentences has been reduced. Um, and uh, the people who are charges against, for example, the drug dealing, uh, are not going to um, death. Um, he, in fact, prominent drug dealers are not anymore. Mr. Giani, Mr. interject here. The thing that I want to know, I, I you know, I know the details that uh, Musavi Marsh has been sentenced. He has been accused of being a CIA slash Mossad agent. All of that is known. Now, my point is, and the reason we are here discussing this, is for you to tell me uh, how this process goes. What is the level of transparency? Because security services can accuse anyone. Does that person, does the accused have, is there a system whereby the accused and the proceedings against him can be seen or washed or or addressed by, by outsiders, where the outsiders can decide that the, that the process is, is just, the process is transparent, that the accused has the right to defense, that the accused has the right to appeal. So that is what I am trying to figure out, and I'm sure my viewers also want to know, what exactly is the system? Um, in fact, for the security issues and the, uh, the people who are accused of espionage, uh, in fact, there is no um, uh, um, transparent information um, of their judiciary process and this um, I can just a process of um, making them um, charges. So there is no information, in fact, um, how is the process. Uh, there is, a, uh, in fact, a um, the judiciary system that do that, but in fact, um, and the uh, specific information on the charges are not um, are not eliminated in these uh, cases, and they are not very transparent on um, such security issues. I thought so. Stay with me, uh, Mr. Riani. Let me go to uh, Dogantikin. Mr. Dogantikin, uh, the reason I asked uh, about transparency. And frankly, I was expecting the response that Mr. Riani gave me. 
uh, because Iran regularly sentences people. I mean, 2016, Nargis Mohammadi, who was an ailing Iranian human rights activist who was already serving a six year uh, jail term, was given a further 16 year sentence by a revolutionary court in Tehran. This was in 2016. In 2015, Iran's judiciary unleashed a wave of heavy jail sentences against artists and activists, uh, which, which, appear, which was seemed to be an attempt to send a warning to those who uh, dare to express dissent. Then uh, in 2018, uh, five environmentalists were charged with national security crimes punishable by death. So it seems that uh, you know, the lack of utter transparency and the use of the term national security can be a very terrible thing for an Iranian citizen or an Iranian dis uh, dissident in Iran. Would you agree with that? Um, first of all, I think this is uh, an indication of a huge tension between the governments of uh, US and Iran. Uh, according to media reports, uh, Iran has so far um, arrested uh, nearly 300 what they call spies. But um, they say, they claim, the Iranian foreign minister, for example, Mohammed Javad Zarif, claims uh, they are just retaliating against the United States. You know, they arrest our people and we arrest theirs. And this is uh, a way of uh, carrying out uh, the political war between the two countries. And these are all political prisoners and the judiciary system will be out of the equation uh, anytime when the governments think it is time to do uh, something and exchange the prisoners or demand something in return for somebody. And we have seen this kind of uh, prisoner swaps uh, in the past few weeks. Uh, Iran has uh, released a U.S. scientist and U.S. has released an, an Iranian scientist and they are brought back to their countries. So um, this is a retaliation tactic, you know, arresting people. And uh, it is, you can call anyone um, a spy. And Mr. Mr. Yeah, precisely, Mr. Dogantikan, Dogantikan, I, I completely uh, understand and I agree with what you're saying. But I think this is just one aspect of the problem. The, the other issue here is a, a sort of totalitarian regime. Uh, for instance, I mentioned the 2015 uh, sentences. Uh, you know, there was a filmmaker, writer, and TV producer, Mustafa Azizi, who was sentenced to eight years in prison. Then there was a painter, Athena Faghadani, uh, who was sentenced to 12 years. Uh, there was uh, yet another uh, activist who was an anti-death penalty activist, Athena Daimi, was sentenced to 14 years. So it's not just about the spies. I mean, there's, there's a certain kind of system which is problematic. I completely agree. But, you know, uh, most countries uh, assess this situation. They uh, weigh the pros and cons of uh, arresting people. And they think, you know, um, violating someone's and individual's human right is uh, nothing compared to overall national interests of a certain country. And they feel like it is doable and they are doing it extensively. You know, uh, what uh, U.S. did to uh, the daughter of Huawei's uh, CEO, he, she is still in Canada waiting extradition to a U.S. And this is part of a big uh, uh, trade war, economic war, the U.S. is trying to uh, carry out in the world. And they are trying to reestablish, I mean, the Trump administration is trying to reestablish their economic uh, uh, superiority in the world. And, and their dealings with Iran is a part of this. Their dealings with China, Venezuela are part of this. These sanctions, um, I, I honestly don't support Iran in many of their uh, policies in the Middle East, especially. But um, U.S. sanctions on any country, it is inhuman. It is punishing the, the population. No, no, I, have, I, 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 completely, I completely agree with you. I mean, as far as the U.S. policy against Iran is concerned, I've done lots of programs on that, and I think uh, it's completely inexcusable, uh, the manner in which the U.S. is dealing with Iran. But right now, we're talking about Iranian system itself. Uh, and... When you talk about the United States and you just gave the example of Huawei and the rest of it, 
uh, I think we kind of comparing apples with oranges because generally the U.S. justice system is very transparent. There are multiple layers. There's right to appeal. There are you know various rights groups, and they can bring a lot of pressure to bear on the government. But let me go back to uh, Ms. Atafe Tohriani here. Ms. Tohriani, as as a as a proud Iranian citizen, uh, you uh, I, I, I'm just assuming that when you say that uh, on issues of national security, there is no transparency, does that bother you in terms of your own rights? And when I say your rights, I'm not just talking personally about you, but the Iranian citizenry, because I'm assuming that in, in case of lack of transparency, the security forces can actually pick up any, anyone and slap any kind of charge on him or her and because there is no transparency, there is no way that the accused can defend himself or herself. Um, in fact, before entering your question, I have to say that Iran, in fact, in, is inside a, uh, is a, in a men mental war. It's in, it's not, it's in um, a real war with United States, and its national security is like a country that it's um, making. Um, steps inside um, a war um, context. So looking upon Iran's national um, security and judiciary system for these issues, like, for example, the assassination of Hassan Soleimani, it's something beyond um, the, the normal, um, normal forms of um, in the world, the glo global um, judiciary systems. In fact, uh, we have to look upon the Iran situation and um, the fact yeah. that um, Mr. It, it Mr. Ghani, Mr. Ghani, let's reject here. See, uh, as I said to uh, uh, Mr. Duganthikan also, as far as the U.S. Uh, policy towards Iran is concerned, I don't think uh, any of us here, uh, whether it's me sitting in Pakistan or Mr. Duganthikan sitting in Turkey, uh, and of course you as an Iranian will obviously uh, you know, oppose that. We all oppose that. So let's set that aside. But my question refers purely to the Iranian justice system itself. And I just gave examples of people uh, who artists, environmentalists, dissidents, uh, protesters, uh, who have been heavily sentenced by Iranian courts. Now, that is something which it's, I'm assuming would uh, greatly bother any Iranian because it takes away the right to defense. In fact, um, if you want to say that the judiciary system of Iran is under question, you have to, um, of course, uh, address the judiciary, uh, judiciary system inside the United States by accusing Iranian citizens without any um, just, in fact, um, real accusation uh, and imprison them, them. And then for a couple of months, for a couple of years, they uh, pretend that they are um, criminals. And then after a couple of years, they release them or just uh, keep them. So it's not the case for Iran. Of course, Iranian judiciary system have to improve. And I, I do agree that um, Iran is in real need of transparency in its judiciary system. Um, but in fact, Iran is a, a conservative in, in, in a couple of um, cases, and it's um, somehow different layers of decision making inside Iran make it um, a boundary um, and a barrier, in fact, to uh, make it completely transparent in these cases. Absolutely, I, 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 I get your point. Uh, stay with me. I'm also joined by Hamad Reza Ghulamzadeh, uh, who is CEO of Peace Spirit Foundation and is also a, an analyst of Iranian foreign policy. Uh, Mr. Ghulamzadeh, uh, just to uh, get you up to speed, uh, we were discussing whether the Iranian judicial system or justice system has transparency or whether it lacks it because uh, on the issue of national security, as we have determined, uh, there is no transparency. Uh, no one really knows uh, why someone is charged. Uh, uh, no one really knows how the process is conducted. Uh, but we have also seen a similar kind of, 
lack of transparency and heavy handedness in terms of dissidents, in terms of environmentalists, in terms of artists, uh, in terms of other activists. Um, and as Ms. Toriani uh, just mentioned, and I agree with her that uh, there is need to improve that. Uh, give me your sense of uh, what kind of improvements do you think is needed by the system in order for it to become more transparent? You know, first of all, I think that we need to get on the same page in, in regard to the terminology of these issues. Uh, you are talking about environmentalists, dissidents, artists, and such things. These terms, actually, and by experience, actually, I can say that are euphemisms for uh, those uh, spies, terrorists, and such people who uh, uh, whose uh, actually uh, crimes has have been pro proved in, at the court, and they have actually gone on uh, the all the uh, judicial procedure. Yes, the Iranian judiciary is not that transparent. I, I admit that, and uh, I can say it needs to be more transparent than what is right right now it is. But the point is that when it comes to national security, there are always a lot of complications and a lot of concerns for the officials. So you and precisely because, the precisely because of those complications, one does need transparency so that one can actually uh, assess uh, outside of the the you know the point of points of view of the security forces whether an accused is actually an accused or not. But I'm also running out of time. So let me just quickly go back to Mr. Dogantikin. So Dogantikin, uh, when we talk about national security, and it's not just an Iranian problem, it's a, it's a widespread problem. Uh, the basic issue uh, becomes one of definition. Who defines national security and its parameters? Because uh, a lot of this has to do with the political leanings or a particular power structure of a state at that particular point in time. I mean, uh, defining what national security is up to uh, sovereign countries. I mean, Israel will decide on its own national security. Turkey, Iran, US will decide um, its own national security threats and assessments. So there's no uh, certain uh, international uh, definition of uh, terrorism or national security. What is a terrorist to you is a hero to others. And so it is a complicated world right now. And it is, these things are going to get worse, unfortunately. These and, things are going to get worse. Um, as, as, you said, as you said just a minute ago, um, Iran is really um, crashing down on uh, dissent in the country. And there were some genuine protests against the regime, Iranian regime. Uh, months back. Um, but uh, somehow, suddenly, the U.S. and Israel got involved, and they have uh, patiently supported the protesters. And, and that gave an advantage, uh, uh, a chance to the Iranian uh, government to, um, to use it and say, look, our enemies are supporting the protesters, so be a good patriot and don't do what your uh, enemies want and just uh, calm down and uh, stand with your government. And mm -hmm. Uh, right now, after the killing of uh, Qasem Soleimani uh, early January, uh, they are uh, taking advantage of this uh, uh, national security issue even more, and they are able to uh, crash down um, on any kind of dissent, any kind of real protesters, like peaceful protesters who want some change, who want some um, nice living standards for, uh, for them. Um, and um, it is going to get worse, uh, as far as I see, because... Um, on the U.S. part, they are willing to escalate the tension. Yeah. And Iran, uh, by arresting all these people, they want to um, retaliate and they want to use these political prisoners as, an, uh, as a diplomatic tool or a political tool, whatever you call it. Absolutely. So, That's, um, most not... That's most unfortunate. It's uh, most unfortunate. I've also run out of time. Thank you so much to Vakas Dogantikin, Ms. Atafe Toghiani, Hamid Erbeza Ghulamzadeh. This is all from In Focus this week. We shall see you next Monday at the same time. Keep following our latest updates on social media at indus.news. Good night and goodbye.